fine, don't worry about it. I can thank you. Oh, yes. Right. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, the two last keynote speakers of the ASEN 2023. is Professor Tariq Modud. And is he a doctor? Should I go with doctor? Or should I go with the professor? Professor. Fine, <laughs> professor for you, but <laughs> one <laughs> professor for you, but <laughs> Professor Sivan Sivan Ho, Sivan Mohan Baluban. He goes by Balu, so I know that he doesn't mind if I just call it Balu. Um, the format, as you can see, is quite different. Uh, it's going to be like more of an interactive. So we'll have a 20 minutes uh, first for Tariq. Then we'll have another 20 minutes for Valo. We'll have five minutes uh, for each to reply to each other position because the point, uh, the fact is that they have two different positions when it comes down to engage with diversity. Um, then we'll open to uh, Q&A at the end. So a few introductions. Professor uh, Tariq Modoud is Professor of Sociology and Politics and Public Policy at the University of Bristol is the funding director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship. Um, he has a presence on YouTube, quite many videos on there. I highly encourage you to go on YouTube and check those videos. Um, very interesting. Um, he, was the, he, he wrote so many books and articles, and is also a public figure, so it's not only academic interventions. Uh, but I would like maybe to mention one, also because I know that it's quite, um, you're quite dear, you're quite close to that publication, which is the future of multi-ethnic Britain, which maybe started maybe the debate around the issue of multiculturalism in the UK. That was the uh, uh, also so-called PAREC report, um, published in 2000, and is a key publication. Um, I would say, that obviously, with Professor PAREC, uh, Tariq is the leading figure when we talk about multiculturalism in the UK, besides also being an international figure, internationally well-renowned scholars in the study of multiculturalism. Uh, Balu uh, is presently based at the University of Warwick. Warwick is an associate professor of sociology in there. Um, he has an ex very What's rich... That, Say it again? <laughs> I didn't capture that. What did you say? I also have YouTube video. Ample. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he, has an, he has written extensively on issues of racism, multiculture, and not multiculturalism. And here already I give you a hint of the fact that the two don't share the same position, particularly on cosmopolitanism. And whereas, if I put it correctly, and by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, whereas Tariq comes more from a communitarian, identitarian perspective, this is a position the value criticizes. It's not coming from that uh, um, intellectual position at all. And that's the reason why the two are together. Um, last night we were joking, sorry guys, like he's going to be like in a boxing ring. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, we are very respectful of each other. and I. Obviously, encourage you all to be very respectful of the position. It would be a very interesting debate, and I'm looking forward to this debate. So, without further ado, there will be 20 minutes first from uh, Tariq. Again, Tariq will have some slides, we'll move here. Then, Valu, the same thing 20 minutes, five minutes each, and then we open for QA. Professor Tariq Madud, the floor is to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I'm mindful that everybody has homes to go to, family waiting for them, um, travel journeys to make. So thank you very much for staying for this uh, final conference event um, to hear me and Valivan address the topic of nationalism and multiculturalism. So. Uh, I'm doing something wrong here. Yeah. That's pressing that one, right? Computers aren't wonderful. Yeah, great. Um, 
So that's my center. And that's the, oh, that's the title. Um, you know, it's obviously my contribution expressing my own angle. And I'll begin with my method, because uh, I do have a very distinctive way of approaching the topic, and that in itself might be quite controversial and worth, worth discussing. So I think everybody here will know what we mean by anti-essentialism and probably share that view. Namely, that when we talk about um, large-scale phenomena, you know, when we use concepts and categories to capture things in the world, like nationalism, like democracy, or even the university, the idea of the university, we don't necessarily use concepts and categories that have a fixed core essence such that all examples of what's captured by the concept, as it were, like all universities or all democracies, all have this set of uh, essential criteria, criteria A, B, C, and whatever they might be. So anti-essentialism is the view that concepts can be meaningful and cogently used without sharing a common essence. I assume we all share that view, perhaps we don't. I certainly hold that view. But there are different versions of anti-essentialism. So the one that I don't share is the, the next bullet point, which I'm calling, we could call it something else, but I'm calling nominalism, which is the view that actually um, we can call anything a democracy. It's up to us. There's no kind of core logic that constrains us from calling certain things democracies. So if we want to call the Soviet Union a democracy or the People's Republic of China or whatever, yeah, it's up to us. Or, with a slight qualification in the brackets, whoever is powerful enough to impose their <coughs> meaning on a concept, that's the meaning of the concept. Well, that's the view I don't hold. My own interpretation of anti-essentialism is derived from the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who argued that the concepts that we use, both simple and complex concepts, when we use them in different contexts or, or ways, or to point to uh, instances, including new instances where you know, uh, we haven't encountered before, they do follow a logic of use. It's not arbitrary, but this logic of use groups things together which have a certain resemblance to each other, what he called a family resemblance, in the way that members of a family share, some of them share similar eyebrows, some of them share high cheekbones, and so on. But they don't all look alike. They're not uniform, but they share some overlapping um, characteristics, similarities. So that's the anti-essentialism that um, I approach uh, when I approach concepts like nationalism. However, I do something else, and this is the more distinctive part. I begin with identifying a minimum. I say, well, what is the minimum that something has to have before we can call it a democracy, or a university, or a nationalism, and so on? The minimum doesn't define the whole concept, far from it. Perhaps nothing in the world will exist which is a one-to-one -one match with the minimum. So the minimum isn't meant to match with any particular instance, with any privileged instances. It's just in order to help group a varied case together, you know, cases that can have some family resemblance. And the Cases will vary in all kinds of ways. I say here there'll be a variable expansion because they'll expand in different ways and in different directions. So certain forms of nationalism will have certain kinds of uh, state characteristics, perhaps kind of a, a republican state characteristic. I mean, you know, like it's in French republicanism. Others will have uh, other characteristics, perhaps to do with religious nationalism, for instance. And what these 
expansionist characteristics are, you know, the additional to the minimum R, are quite contingent, meaning we don't know in advance what they are, such that we can predict what they will be and what they won't be. Contingent means um, things will turn out as they turn out, and we can't uh, limit them to a certain formula. Uh, because concepts change, they get expanded, they get extrapolated, um, and that is part of the normal uh, logic and coherence of concepts. It's not a, uh, a limitation or a liability. And in brackets, I've given an example, so I don't know, you know whether you've come across my work in that respect, but this is the approach that I've been using in relation to discussing uh, racisms and in secularisms. So um, some people, you know, well, well let me get on to the uh, nationalism bit. So one implication of this approach of mine is that there's no single fullness or true or real instance of the concept. In this case, nationalism. There can be different kinds of nationalisms. It's not like, oh, this is the true nationalism. All these others are uh, disguised forms of nationalism or fake or um, second-class versions of nationalism. And I've been using this with secularism and racism so that, for instance, some people uh, say that, oh, secularism is about separation of church and state in a particular kind of way. And I show through pointing to an, a variety of cases, including our own country here, that actually that's not true. Secularism can be varied. And similarly with racism. People think racism is all about biology or color racism and so on. And I say, well, no, it's not. Um, I won't be going into those examples today. I'm just illustrating that I'm trying to use a method in relation to nationalism that I've already been using in relation to other large-scale concepts like secularism and racism. So turning specifically to nationalism, I'll then define it in this two-step way, you know, the minimal and then the expansion. So for me, the minimal and you'll see that it is very thin, the minimal is a societal perspective or a politics that gives normative significance to the national. And then I say, OK, what about all the examples, all the instances in the world, past and present or future, about nationalism? I say, well, yes, this um, normative significance to the national can be made to connect with other things that have normative significance. Like for some people, their religion obviously has a normative significance for them, and they might want to connect the significance they give to their national, to their nation or country, or however they characterize it, they might want to connect it to their religion. Others may not. Other, other people have a normative uh, significance in relation to, let's say, um, individual freedom, and they might want to connect that to the idea of we are a free nation or we are a nation of free people or whatever. So that's how a particular example of nationalism will get elaborated and expanded because they'll connect different normative um, uh, features, different things that they value to each other and in particular to the, the national. And putting it crudely, the more things they connect with the more nationalist will be the concept. Uh, that's a little bit crude, but I'll, I'll leave it like that. But I do want to emphasize the very last point there. There'll be no single end point of which will say, oh, well, that's now the true nationalism or real nationalism. So we, we, we will have a genuine multiplicity of cases, uh, a genuine variety. And some implications of what I believe I'm saying is that nationalism is varied and to accept one kind is not to necessarily accept another. So it's not the case that we could define all possible positions by, in terms of pro-nationalists and anti-nationalists. 
nationalists, you know, within my uh, framework, will disagree with each other, perhaps just as much as they'll disagree with non-nationalists or anti-nationalists and so on. So just because someone's a nationalist, it doesn't mean they accept all possible nationalisms. In fact, that's never happened, and you know, the idea doesn't make any sense that they would. We know that they disagree with each other, and that different kinds of nationalisms are actually logically incompatible with each other. Moreover, another implication is that othering, you know, creating a group, whether it's a minority within your country or an uh, outside group or groups, and saying, we are this because they are something else, othering or exclusion is involved in some kinds of nationalism. I think we all are aware of that. But is not, you'll see, is not part of the core definition. And importantly, does not capture the normative character of nationalism. So if someone said, oh, I know what nationalism is, it's all about othering and exclusion, I'd have to say, no, that's not what nationalism is about, because you haven't yet got your you know, finger on the normative significance of nationalism, because it must have normative significance to its advocates, perhaps not to its opponents, but to its advocates. No one would be a nationalist if they didn't think it was something important and valuable, something to be advocated and promoted. So it's the normative character of nationalism that we have to first, first understand before we can look at you know, other contingent aspects of it. So what about the normative connections that I want to make? OK, so here are four that connect the idea of the national to the state, to citizenship, to belonging. And that's really pretty common. There's nothing original about that whatsoever. Um, but nevertheless, I want to do that as well, just as quite a lot of other people do. What's distinctive about what I'm doing is number four. I want to connect not only the national to state citizenship and belonging, I also want to connect it to the idea of multicultural recognition or inclusion. The idea that minorities or identity groups in general have to be uh, respected and included within a conception of the national. And I'll obviously say quite a lot more about that. For the moment, all I'll just say is that all of the above have some historical cultural character. They must have some historical cultural character because it's impossible to have a, a state, in my opinion anyway, to have a state which is culturally contentless. It must use a language. It'll have a history. It'll have all kinds of cultural reference points and so on. Um, and so the idea that the state is in some ways culturally neutral is, is a fiction, is an impossible idea. But all those things cannot be reduced to rights. So, you know, liberal conception of rights, whatever it is, individual rights, or even individual plus collective rights. And so I want to say uh, the kind of thing I'm arguing for uh, multicultural nationalism is culturalist and you see I put that in quote marks because different people might have different meanings for that and for some people it's already a negative anyway so I'll put it in quote marks but it's a culturalist as well as a civic nationalism on the whole I don't work with, with that distinction you know ethnic, civic, culturalist um, civic I just, I just really want to say it's both um, so let me now say something about this multiculturalism to explain how it can be connected to nationalism. So part of the normative core of multiculturalism are two concepts of equality. And this slide is about the first concept, which is in some ways a classical liberal concept of equality, certainly within that family of concepts. And so um, I say, firstly, we should understand it in terms of equal rights, non-discrimination. You know, if Christians are allowed to do this, why aren't Muslims? If, you know, white people enjoy certain kinds of opportunities, why don't people who are not white uh, enjoy those opportunities? So there's nothing radically new in that. I think we all, we all understand the idea of non-discrimination and uh, sameness of treatment. 
But I do want to say something about it which is often overlooked, namely that this first concept, uniformity of treatment, can be interpreted in two different ways, A and B. So A is what I call equalizing downwards. And it is sometimes interpreted like this in practice. Uh, and I give an example. Supposing um, someone says, well, Christians have all kinds of privileges in uh, British society, like uh, state funding for schools, or at least at one time only Christians had that. That's not the case today. But the, the role of the Anglican Church, for instance, in the coronation that's about to take place in a, in a month's time and so on. So we can think of all kinds of examples. And someone might say, well, that's not egalitarian. Why should one group of people or one institution have these kinds of uh, privileges? Let's get rid of those privileges. That's what I mean by equalizing downwards. So anyone who seems to have anything above the, the line or above other people, you bring them down. So if Muslims complain about why are Christians privileged, you say, oh, don't worry about that. We will unprivilege them. But it's interesting that very few Muslims would be, are satisfied with that answer. They don't feel somehow they're being treated with equality and respect when they're told that Christians will be disprivileged. And that brings into play then the second way of um, employing this concept, equalizing upwards, which is giving Muslims and others the same provision as currently enjoyed by Christians. So, for example, if we have... Um, school holidays marked by Christian holidays you know, like we're about to have Easter well why not Eid why not Diwali why not Hanukkah and so on so that's what we would be saying is equalizing upwards bringing those people who currently don't enjoy certain provisions into line with those who do enjoy them that's a form of equality so that's equalizing upwards and the multiculturalist presumption is to consider the possibility of B, of upwards, oh my God, before A, downwards, to avoid any form of downwards movement or loss of dispossession. When I said, oh my God, it's because I just had a sign flashed in front of me which said five minutes. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but obviously I have to leave a few things out. I'll just tell you what the second concept of equality is and then I'll edit the rest of the talk because you do need to know this, because this is the most distinctive contribution of multiculturalism to normative thinking, the second concept of equality. Equality as respect for difference, which can require differential treatment, as the important thing is to focus on a group's needs, as well as on what provision is generally available. For example, Christians have no dietary needs that are met at school. They used to, you know, like no fish, on, uh, no meat on Friday, but we forget about that because they don't exercise that anymore. But that is not a reason to deny Muslims and Jews kosher or halal meals at school if they ask for them. So the French state says that's a form of discrimination. It's privileging Muslims and Jews. For the multiculturalists, that's a form of equality because it's treating all groups in terms of their needs and not treating Muslims and Jews by using a Christian template, by saying, well, what do Christians need? Okay, Muslims and Jews, you'll get the same. That's not uh, multicultural equality. Having said that, and what should I now do for the remaining four minutes? Um, well, I'll have to just very quickly go through some of this. So I unpack multicultural equality um, by reference to four features which, you know, you can read on the screen probably faster than I can um, read them out. Um, and it may be that, you know, I'll have to spell them out in more detail uh, in discussion with uh, Valivan or with um, response to your questions and comments. But here's two. Uh, these are, for me, parts of what I mean by multicultural equality. And I perhaps just underline... Um, in number one, you can see protection of minorities against certain forms of majority exclusion, hegemony, domination, and so on. But the, in, the bit at the end in brackets is very important. But not the majority culture per se. 
There's nothing about multiculturalism that's anti-majority culture. It's about the relationship between the majority culture and minority culture within an inclusive national identity. It's not about being anti-majority culture or anything like that. So the other two aspects of multicultural equality are on this slide. Um, and is there something I should really emphasize? Um, well, I think number four is very important because for me, multiculturalism is incomplete without number four, but it is a kind of an advanced stage of multiculturalism. We can't begin with that. It usually takes quite a lot more um, thinking and mobilizing and uh, critical engagement and so on, contestation of ideas, before we properly begin to rethink an inclusive national identity, i.e. to multiculturalize our national identity. But that is what I'm arguing for. That is what multicultural nationalism includes. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly mention it. Um, I then go on to distinguish my own view from the views of people who say they're liberal nationalists, like, say, David Miller. So what are the differences between someone like me and, and liberal nationalists? Two things. Uh, liberal nationalism is not about group recognition. My version clearly is, um, including ethno-religious groups, because on the whole, liberal nationalists tend to be focused on individual rights or questions of redistribution and welfare or secularized public spaces, which aren't at the center. Those projects are not at the center of multicultural nationalism. And then you have someone like Will Kimlicker, who clearly is a a multiculturalist, but he too says he is in favor of liberal nationalism because he says he advocates the thinning of the national culture um, so that uh, minorities are not alienated by aspects of the national culture. Let's thin it down. I say, no, we don't thin it down. We remake it to include the minorities. And that follows my principle of uh, equalizing upwards, not equalizing downwards. You don't uh, include minorities by dispossessing other people, unless, of course, there are aspects of exclusion, like racism and so on, in that particular aspect of majority practice or uh, symbolism or whatever. And so that finally takes me to my very last slide. Sorry about the rush. Um, which is that I think multicultural nationalism is not just a good idea, it's actually a feasible alternative, a practical contemporary alternative to what I'll crudely call bad nationalism, you know, populist, right-wing, uh, monocultural, majoritarian nationalism. Because it's based on valuing collective, non-economic identities that are important to people and are consistent with equal citizenship. So you know, that's my understanding of multicultural uh, nationalism. And multicultural nationalism unites the concerns of some of those who are currently sympathetic to majoritarian nationalism because it you know, argues we don't need to uh, be hostile to majority culture per se, only its exclusionary aspects. Um, so it unites the concerns of people who are sympathetic to majority, majoritarian nationalism and those who are pro-diversity. I'm not so naive as to think that all majoritarian nationalisms will be cheering multicultural nationalism and say, hallelujah. But there are people across the spectrum, including, including uh, we see from opinion poll surveys about the electorate in Britain. So there are people who can be won over, who have certain sympathies in both directions, for instance. Um, and therefore, multicultural nationalism represents the political idea and tendency most likely to offer a feasible alternative to monocultural nationalism. Because I think we all will agree that monocultural nationalism is a very big challenge, and we do need feasible alternatives to monocultural nationalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to Balaban, please. Balo, you have 20 minutes. So uh, thank you for the invite. Um, 
though you, he, Marco seemed to present this as a pugilistic affair, it really isn't. I think, to be honest, we're going to be speaking entirely at cross purposes insofar as I don't think I'm going to entertain an ideal theory, the formulations of various permutations of the re relationship between a liberal affordance to the multicultural state vis-a-vis -vis the possibilities of affordances of nationalism. But I have no grief, or I have no grief with, with uh, Tarek in many ways about how he staged a long, distinguished, and important debate and tradition around multiculturalism. There are many things from it that is still enduring and relevant to a lot of my life in terms of our thinking, the circles that I keep close company with. For not least, something you alluded to, the forceful and much overdue interrogation of the secular ideal that secularism, that its masked neutrality, or rather its purported neutrality, actually masked a very particular particularity, uh, usually modeled in a particular kind of drift of protestant liberal democratic culture, but therein got amplified as the universal ideal. I think Tarek and his circles have been very forceful in helping see through some of the secularism conceits. I think indirectly Tarek's work and some of the people associated with you have helped profile the sheer centrality of Islamophobia to the racisms and the particular nationalist cultures that afflict much of Western Europe, not least Britain, but much of Western Europe more broadly. I know it's not necessarily a headline theme for you, but that kind of wider interrogation of the overdetermined place of Islamophobia in Western European life was something I think you indirectly cued for the rest of us. And of course, there is a lot about how multiculturalism debates were initially staged that helped understand the importance of some kind of diversification or representational culture, that this has real merits, and in fact, this is a progressive ideal that most anti-racism should champion. Having said that, I honestly come from a very humanities tradition, critical theory tradition. I am unfortunately a lot more left-wing than you, so there are also those implications. I'm also much more formidably located, I don't mean I am formidable, but I'm formidably located in, in more pronounced contemporary anti-racist conversations, which of course, for better or for worse, have become very high profile. There's a lot of heat, very little light at times, but anti-racism and some of those debates is where I find myself more properly located. So on those terms, I'm, we're gonna be speaking entirely at cross purposes, but that's okay, because I think we'll find some common themes to share or at least interrogate during the rest of the discussion. I know some, honestly, I, I'm also ap ap apologizing because I want to talk a lot about just contemporary British politics and the very particular, not multiculturalism as ideal theory, but multiculturalism as it becomes imbricated in the particularities of British nationalism's hardening or reconsolidated zealotry. Um, I do also use, unfortunately, a pretty flowery, florid Edwardian English. Uh, I'm sorry if you're... <laughs> You find it impenetrable. I can't help myself because I improvise for the most part, and that's the English that comes most naturally to my tongue in these terms. Um, so, yeah, sorry, you won't understand much, whatever. Uh, anyways, uh, I, of late I wrote a fairly well-received book, so I suppose my own work, I, I'm just gonna speak through that and then queuing contemporary political impasses. My own work is increasingly centered around the reconsolidation of, 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 a, uh, of a kind of sweeping and, and as of now electorally triumphant brand of British, but more properly put, and I'm aware of some Scottish figures here, but more properly put, English nationalism in, in, in this country. And English nationalism that amongst other indicators of cruelty is now embarking upon such intense forms of anti-migrant bordering and demagoguery that it is in fact threatening, or it is threatening to conclusively renege on the very possibility of asylum to this country. I, I, uh, my father was an asylum seeker, he was given asylum, uh, albeit in Sweden, and via him, my own fate too was settled. In that way, multiculturalism as a debate can seem completely moot. If no one can come here, I don't care. It is of no consequence whether we get our own ship in place in order, if in fact the whole political order change turns on anti-migration as the overdetermined object of nationalist desire. Um, of course, of course, just because I am from another part of the world, I do need to say that English nationalism's colonial and racial ills are, is considerable, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that because that will be a tome in itself and it'll be boring and it will derail everything. But just to, sh I know there's a recording to so my own crowd back home, I am aware of those things, but we're not going to touch on those matters. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got to say the guardrails. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But instead, I think I'm just going to raise a couple of remarks about 
a very particular contemporary conjuncture where actually this nationalism as we inhabit also stands to reinvent itself in particular ways that I do think pose certain challenges to some of the conventions commonly attributed to multiculturalism as a politics or a style of political claim making. So firstly, and what has perhaps changed most noticeably across the last few decades since that kind of um, uh, 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 multicultural moment, is that the, the ability of the nation in some important senses to expand its remit, to expand its remit of belonging, um, uh, uh, reconfiguring a more accommodating, distinct, in, in, in symbolically multicultural assertion of its otherwise equally reactionary sense of nationalist selfhood. So, if, and, you know, uh, if we're really taking stock of the last 30 years since the multicultural moment and what we reckon with today, it is, it is salutary to note the less than white, the less than pale complexion of a governing front bench. Um, I am always, frequently surprised how often we're in this debate and this is not discussed. It, it is quite consequential, I think, that we see who is our prime minister, who is in cabinet, so on and so forth. And the active place of brown and black demagogues as emphatic innovators, not bystanders, as emphatic innovators of a post-Brexit UKIPified governing right and all its internal breakdown as well, admittedly. I, and I hasten to add that this, the, 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 the prominence of non-white headliners in cabinet and so on can no longer be credibly dismissed as simply some kind of tokenism, which is what some anti-racists still continue to insist. If it is tokenism, they're doing an awful lot of it. It's an absolute windfall of tokens. Some, you know, quite frankly, some Tory party, like some master puppeteer of the Tory party has misplaced the dictionary definition of what a token is because they're doing an incredible amount of it. Uh, so really, we've got to kind of reconfigure what we're reckoning with here. So our cabinet, our prime minister, I do recall here, akin to what you're saying about the religious affordance, I do recall a kind of quite telegenic, photogenic ceremony, a Diwali ceremony, led by Sunak and his billionaire wife outside Downing Street. That is, in its own terms, a significant multicultural moment or at least a threshold in terms of configuring with a new form of politics or reckoning with a new form of politics. So our cabinet, our PM, and indeed some aspects of recent, some aspects of recent referendum and electoral voting patterns, I think can be better construed as essentially a metonym, if you like, a metonym of an emergent reconstitution of the politics of British, what, what I would still call British narcissism and fortified cruelty in ways that no longer can simply be explained as simply a recidivist whiteness, okay? The, the, the call to whiteness is not sufficient to explain the whole of these political stakes. Um, so instead, in, uh, you know, uh, as the excellent authors, a collective, uh, call, uh, they're not called anything, but they wrote something called Empire Endgame, which I couldn't recommend enough. Half of them are my friends, admittedly, but, but I would recommend them in their own right for non-nepotistic reasons. In so far as they are, they are the best going in terms of cultural theory, anti-racism, left politics, but taking strong positions. In Empire Endgame, they argue that the task of anti-racism is not to deny, not to analytically deny the ways in which someone like Preeti Patel represents a set of multiracial or multicultural even entry points into the politics of cruel Britannia, but instead the task of anti-racism is to, is to actually adapt, our, or the task is to adapt our anti-racism so it can better reckon with and foresee that very likelihood. The likelihood where uh, uh, nationalism is reconsolidated, reconfigured in ways where it can absorb multicultural representational coordinates in still yet asserting and affirming its multiplying uh, uh, fears and aversions to the outside and to those who at any given moment are construed as not belonging, iconically not belonging. Be that the migrant, be that the refugee, be that the asylum seeker, be the, it not least the Muslim against the wider frame of Islamophobia as I already alluded to as it anchors so much of British political intuition. Uh, be it the specter, be it the EU naturally obviously, be it the specter of China which has world historical reckonings. I know in Britain that politics hasn't really taken off yet but we're seeing it. Even Biden is playing on it in a very heavy way and we're seeing a centrist version where that's going to be amplified in ways that the naivety of our conversations of, and I don't mean here, you guys are very intelligent people, but nonetheless there's a naivety where we are just putting that on the back burner and not realizing how Western nationalism and certainly Anglophone transatlanticist nationalism are going to catch their wind and you know all sorts of reckonings and ructions will unfold on that front. Um, be it even a general aversion to de 
the deracinated cosmopolitan lefties running amok all over Dulcet, England and the sweet foothills of provincial England. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've certainly been slandered many, many, many a time as being a allegedly av avocado-eating cosmopolitan lefty. Let me tell you, I don't care about avocado or sandwiches. I just eat normal food. But nonetheless, there is that intimation that somehow it is kind of a lifestyle, aloofness, whatever it may be. Um, Albeit, of course, a more generalized sense of internationalism and its specific organs that somehow, somehow are construed as kind of being an unbearable albatross that undermines our, the, our precious, otherwise intact, otherwise immaculate, self-sufficient, autarkic sovereignty, to steal a phrase from the recent Brexiteer jargon. Um, so that's one front, that's one point on the, the oh, but moving on, so on one form, form I'm talking about uh, the kind of not the above diversification, if you like, of a politics of contemporary nationalist conservat conservatism. I do think we should also perhaps pay attention to some of the shifting poetics of reactionary whiteness itself in ways that I want, I am there to offer those who happen to identify as white a different program uh, in a way that I don't think multiculturalism is quite there. So namely, we might want to observe how, um, how uh, uh, a whiteness as anchored to English belonging, which is only one modality of English belonging, but a significant one, but a whiteness as anchored to English belonging is increasingly less formally about privilege and superiority uh, on those things, and it's much more about a poetics of resentful, revengeist uh, 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 melancholia. In other words, as, as Western economies, and certainly the sorry parlor state of our British economy, our English, I know a lot of you are not here, so you can be the quick return to where our, where our, what I hope is more stable infrastructures. But nonetheless, you know, the, sorry, the state of Western European world historical decline, there's not much we can do about it on these terms, but world historical economic decline, and in terms of where the wages of whiteness, to steal a phrase from, the, from Du Bois way back, but the, where the wages of whiteness in its allegedly more literal sense no longer obtain as readily as before. And in those terms, we say a texture of whiteness that is increasingly less about the safeguarding of privileges or superiority per se, but in my mind, it's much more about the distinctly embittered and unfortunately also the, the latent fascist possibility that arises amidst the perception or experience of, of, of thwarted or frustrated entitlement that I, as a white English, deserve something better. That thwarted, frustrated, unmoored, displaced entitlement. And where the masochism, where the masochism therein of perceived decline and loss converts where the masochism converts into the externalized sadism of preoccupations with, with, with nationalist identity and nationalist aversion, not least to multiculturalism, as Tariq alluded to in terms of the refortification of majoritarian nationalism. So in other words, we have something <coughs> akin to, forgive my psychoanalytic thing, I told you I'm from the humanities, so you, you guys most pro probably political science people are finding it all <laughs> terribly imprecise, but what not, you're, not, you're, you're my people, that's good. We need some kindred spirits. My PhD is meant to be here, but he's not here. He was my other kindred spirit. Uh, did he present this Pavan? Pavan? I don't know where the hell he's gone. He's, he's gone drinking somewhere. Uh, uh, but, but, um, but you know, did, um, what was I saying? Psychoanalysis. Ah. No, no, with the notion of the uncanny. As from an anti-racist perspective, it feels like we, have a we kind of encounter a certain kind of uncanny dystopia where one has in fact escaped one whiteness a whiteness of privilege and supremacism, only to thereupon encounter a new whiteness scored by a new set of psychosocial properties. Psychosocial properties are repertoires of loss, decline, and festering zealous melancholia. Put differently, it seems to me now a harnessing of something called white English pain, White English pain, often indexed to a ge uh, symbolism of provincial or town-based geographies. They're completely obsessed with the symbolism of the town, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a, a provincial town-based geography, where we therein see a texture of English whiteness that is less about the safeguarding of supreme, uh, super, super, uh, what, what shall I say, where it, where it kind of, we see a politics of English whiteness that actually doesn't, just merely aspires for a monopoly on the public staging of deserving victimhood, a public monopoly on a staging of deserving victimhood. This is not there in a nationalism that actually expects or presents itself as anything will get better. In fact, they say anything but. It is rather about the righteous dignity 
the righteous dignity of having one's own nationalized pain, the righteous dignity of having one's own nationalist pain, visualized as the only authentic one, and the only pain that is locked into a competitive economy with the pain of others. And that majoritarian logic sits or asserts itself. And particularly, this, yeah, okay, five minutes, you say that, you say that, you say that, all right. Uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> oh, you upped the stakes, did you? Well, I better get going. Um, but you know, I, I'm getting somewhere about multiculturalism. Uh, particularly decisive, and this is where my, I show my more left-wing colors, particularly decisive is the kind of recourse to class that helps anchor this sense of white English victimhood. Consider here now the ubiquitous tropes of claims to the left behind, or what is now increasingly coined as something called the white working class. Uh, of course, this recourse to class is entirely disingenuous, entirely emptied of any materialist content, entirely emptied of any socioeconomic content, entirely indifferent to any notion of class conflict or class struggle. Instead, instead working class identity becomes selectively repurposed as merely a proxy for a very particular cultural subject, a cultural subject that is to be always provincial, always white, always English, always patriotic, always socially conservative, and of course, not least, always anti-immigration and anti-multiculturalism. Uh, uh, For some reason, they claim white people on their terms on the most disrespectful, condescending, insulting terms. I, if that is homage, I have no idea what insult looks like. Um, but. So we have here a culturalization of class that has become very pointed, where class suffering is merely a, 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 is culturalized as identity, culturalized as aggrieved Englishness, culturalized as nostalgic whiteness. And by that logic, I do fear, and I'm not talking about Tarek's work, I'm talking about where I sit in anti-racism and what a kind of formal style of multiculturalism is. I do fear that a politics of multiculturalism as a kind of normative logic in the public sphere also shares a certain complicity here where some of the formal 1990s successes of multiculturalism as a style, or at least early Blairite styling or patronage of something called multiculturalism, meant that anti-racist claim making also took on an identitarian and culturalized logic, where one's experience of racism was now about a set of group rights and cultural dignities that were otherwise being denied, that were otherwise being with, withheld. And this commitment to multicultural and often you know, a groupist, it's fine, we can, you know, as you made a point of defense of that, a groupist claim making, whatever its other, other justified merits, and I believe I, I try to identify its merits that I think are important nonetheless, not least about the interrogation of Islamophobia, secularism, and representation of politics, whatever its other justified merits, the, it did nonetheless displace here some other competing anti-racist traditions. Anti-racist traditions that were much more insistent on how the experience of racialization and the experience of migrant status and migrant hardship and migrant demagoguery and migrant hierarchy, that this was also about class outcomes, that we were living out class struggles. I grew up in a estate. I didn't, it wasn't the cultural rights I was struggling with. It was poverty and the fascists. That was it. There was no, I wasn't waiting to go pray somewhere. I could go pray somewhere anyways. You know what I mean? But there were different implications to what that politics and anti-racist tradition was. And, and, um, and they were always also about uh, aspiration to solidaristic class collectivism, where there is a pointed tradition of anti-racist cultural politics, but also trade union politics, or at least activist politics, that did, as a gesture, routinely try to make common cause with their working class peers who happened to identify as white and English, but to relieve them of the defensiveness of thinking you're white and English, but still trying to maintain class solidarity, or the, at least the prefigurative terms of class solidarity. And so, in my opinion, I mean, the formal institutionalization, briefly, because we know it's under a lot of stress now, but the formal institutionalization of multiculturalism as a style did unfortunately see, in my opinion, mainstream anti-racism vacate its erstwhile or possible class orientations, which in itself is maybe bad, but it becomes particularly bad because it therein rendered itself vulnerable to English nationalism's subsequent attempt to reclaim class class symbolism, certainly, as the exclusive preserve, as the exclusive precinct of white English people who are al allegedly left unmoored by a socially liberal and multicultural mores of a present. Uh, do I have two minutes still? You do. Oh, good. All right, let's go. Let me just, I'll just very quickly change tack then in that case. Uh, 
just rush a little bit. I, I, obviously, I'm presenting quite a resigned partial view of events. So against these two converging tendencies, one, one a, a, a uh, diversified nationalism, if you like, on the one hand, and the other a melancholic reactionary whitening of class on the other, I just want to uh, allude to a kind of couple quick remarks about how at least in my tradition, and it's not in any way at war with Tarek's position, but in my position, we are perhaps less formally interested in multiculturalism and we remain much more interested in what many people still describe, and I know you don't think much of it maybe, but what, what many people think of as the actual everyday lived cultural working class people across and through difference, and how those energies remain for us the most important premise in activating political possibility. Um, and this multiculture, contrary to popular opinion, isn't just a preserve, a preserve of our large iconic cities, but characterizes many a corner of our suburbs, many a corner of our provincial towns. I can see even in Loughborough it's there. I don't know anything else about Loughborough, but you can sell something. Uh, I also, they seem to have sports facilities everywhere. I forgot that. Um, but, um, and also, not least, because I'm a media theorist too, the a multiculture that characterizes extraordinary many mem uh, corners of our digital screens and its subsequent effects. Um, unfortunately, I'll be the first to agree, uh, admit, and I think Tariq would agree with this too, but much academic research about such things unfortunately succumbs very quickly to extremely silly platitudes, descriptive platitudes about diversity in its own right, um, mo much more akin to a kind of liberal, corp uh, liberal corporate politics of representation and not much else. But on the contrary, at least in the tradition of someone like Paul Gilroy, it remains absolutely formative for me. But a lot of younger scholars now, Luke de Neronia's extraordinary book, Deporting Black Britons, but it's actually about the conviviality amidst the bloody, sorry, uh, amidst the <laughs> brutality, amidst the brutality of what is otherwise a detention center. Or Ben Rogali's fascinating work on warehouse workers and food processing workers in provincial Peterborough and the kind of slow multiculture and class awareness that gets forged in the intimacies of their socialization and common inhabitation. Or Amit Singh, another young scholar's excellent work on a East London, uh, on a, a boxing gym on the outer extremities of East London and the very particular multiculture that gets cultivated there. And all of these people share fundamentally that multiculture can be many things, but as fundamental as a political stake, we're interested in how it is always about working class mutuality with, through, and across, and beyond difference. And how through various forms of social and cultural entanglement, what gradually unfolds is a loosening of the need to always police politics, space, identity, and culture along defensive indices of group identity, not least defensive indices of, uh, of white English entitlement, white English central, uh, centrally, white English uh, normativity. And just to end, ah, 30 seconds, just to end, uh, <laughs> you also did 30 seconds, Madhu. <laughs> just to end, I'm, it's in no way a, a very, I'm not trying to put aside Tariq's work, but what, I, what I'm interested in, I do find that there's a new generation of younger, cult, the, this is the kind of cultural politics that a new generation of anti-racist writing is much more interested in. Uh, be, and a lot, more, uh, a lot more committed to, not about top-down legislative politics, about a set of group rights that a liberal state might afford to minorities. Good Lord, this liberal state scarcely exists now. It's a beleaguered harass on its final, you know, in its final hurrah in any case. But instead, it's about the horizons of everyday horizons of multiracial working class culture that can be harnessed or up amplified for better political effect and also allows us to re-enter the terms of class in ways that rescue it from its, pres its current status as a preserve or exclusive preserve of populist, you know, its populist enclosures. And these being horizons that are not about defensive, I'm this group, I'm that group, you have these rights, I'm going to have these rights, a defensive cautiousness, but it's about the affirmative, mutually enchanting unlearning of those very nationalist and racial logics by which we otherwise conceive of political belonging, and not the small matter of shared purpose. That was 30 seconds. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hoping for some pugilistic tension to keep the audience alive. Two days is long. Uh, but I was saying, if not, so I will leave it to you when you want to respond, when you prefer to open the QA. Would you like to offer a response? I'd like to pick up on a couple yeah. of points. Would you mind maybe to move? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was asked to. I was asked to. 
speak from here. Maybe people can hear better. Yeah, so I don't want to um, hog the time even more than Balu and I have already done, but I would like to test out a little bit of a response because you said that um, there may be, um, we may be at cross purposes. So I want to try and address that. Mm. And you said you weren't interested in ideal theory. I don't think that's true at all. I think you're a lot more idealistic in your theorizing than I am. So I think that I would describe my uh, approach as that we need a normative perspective. You know, we being people who want to understand society, but also to some extent um, criticize society, to offer alternatives, to offer, if you like, intellectual leadership. We need a normative perspective which has to be argued for in relation to objections and alternatives and so on. And that's what I try to do. I would say that what, how I try to do it, I would characterize it as grounded normative theory. Mm. So I don't begin with abstract ideas or I try to minimize that. But I rather work with tendencies in the real world, mm. in Britain, in other countries. And I think that what, what I was describing is multicultural nationalism against liberal nationalism, against monocultural nationalism and so on. These all exist. They all exist in Britain. They all exist in other countries. And it's a matter of um, developing some to a further a stage of coherence and political attractiveness relative to others. So I'm not picking out ideas from the sky or you know, pure abstractions. I'm working with what we already have in the world. And I would in particular point to, I'd, I'd say, uh, Britain, Canada, and Australia as probably the three best examples that fit my understanding of debates around multicultural nationalism versus liberal nationalism. And then I emphasized, right at the end, but I emphasized feasibility. So how can I be talking about ideal theory? Mm. I'm talking about what will work. I'm not interested in what won't work. And in fact, I think a lot of what you say probably wouldn't work because you are so idealistic that you're willing to pitch yourself against society as a whole, against most political possibilities. That's idealism. So I'm a lot more grounded. Uh, so if there is a cross-purpose, it's not because I am living in some kind of ideal um, stratosphere. And maybe I'll just use um, what you said about Islamophobia as an example and then you know, sit down. So, I mean, the, my work on Islamophobia, which doesn't take as much space as my work on multiculturalism in terms of working out its normative connections and political possibilities, but the work on Islamophobia is very important. And I think you acknowledged that it's played a pioneering role. But where I differ from what I might call merely being anti-Islamophobia as part of merely being anti-racist is, okay, identify Islamophobia, see how it works, its structures and processes, find ways of challenging it, but we need an idea of something positive, not just opposing something, but what about positive recognition of Muslims so they have a sense of belonging and a place in British society or German or French or whatever it might be, not just by opposing something, but by making Muslims part of Britain through their own agency, but in a dialogical, cooperative and collaborative way with other people. So that requires some kind of multiculturalist political project and not merely an anti-racist one. glad that some pugilistic tension is back. <laughs> so now the word is uh, Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm happy to roll back the ideal theory remark. I, I think it's more that I am much more a conjunctural thinker. So I wouldn't talk about the penalties of how class has been repurposed 
if I wasn't trying to address very particular contingencies of the political struggles and impasses that I feel I am encountering. So there's a conjuncture in how multiculturalism can be talked about by Kim Lika in 1994, half, to half the time about Quebec, that I'm just thinking that conjunct, whatever his modeling does not travel and I'm not particularly interested in thinking that Kim Lika, David Miller, even Kukatas, is that his name? Yes. They can tell us anything about the very particular politics that allow for Brexit, that allow for the repurposing of class identity, that allow for anti-racism both to thrive and to be cut simultaneously. So I'm a conjunctural analyst, that's all. So I cannot, I will, the what I will say today will not be what I said in 1952. And what I will say in 2042 is going to be a very different reckoning too. I suspect some of the politics I have today I would not have had in 1980s. I wouldn't talk about white resentment and revengeous melancholy. I would talk about white supremacy and you're beating us up. You know, that, that's the conjunctural term. So I'm not saying you are somehow ungrounded and so on. What I mean is that the terms of contingency are very live to the kind of political questions I'm asking and at least what I feel, the analytic questions I chase. That's a quite a different reckoning. Uh, at war with the social world? No, I think I'm at romance with the social world. <laughs> I'm at romance with the social world. I am interested in multiculture precisely because I find all its, its frisson, its energy as an extraordinary escape from the suffocating morass and dystopia today. I'm not going to bend to that dystopia. Why would I bend to that dystopia and say I'm in agreement with the social world and I am a grounded theorist? Am I going to agree with Hindutva, bend to Hindutva when I go back to India and say I'm in agreement with the social world? No, I'm in agreement with another social world that is there and is routinely rehearsed and is being routinely staged. So I'm a romantic sociologist, a romantic cultural theorist, but it's always locked into particularities of the kind of social exposures that we encounter. I am as much interested in a BLM protest as I'm interested in hip hop music on TV and how that remakes the working class. I'm as much interested in Marcus Rashford as I'm interested in Paul Gilroy. Not Marcus Rashford pointedly, because of a very particular political rationale that comes out of his ability to claim a stage. A claim about food banks. A claim about food banks, not cultural rights for him. Because it doesn't matter, we know how blackness is criminalized. He can go to a, him, not him, he's too rich now, but obviously, his peers can go to a club. The point isn't whether the club is playing black music or not. The point is that when he's going to the club, he's getting criminalized and stopped and searched. That is why I'm interested in racism. And going back to Australia, Canada, and England, I don't know if that, I mean, in all honesty, I find that inadequate inspirations, because in so far as, I grew up in Sri Lanka. We have multiculturalism. Yes. You know, we have the school holidays you were speaking about. When I was very young, we had Eid holiday, Christmas holiday, Poya every day, every month, the full moon for Buddhists. We had holiday. We have multiculturalism. And guess what? The Buddhist chauvinist Sri Lankan nationalists still showed up and still launched war for 30 years. And the Tamil nationalists also got caught up and insisted on their own nationalist violences. We had multiculturalism the whole time, we still do. I was growing up in a position where you had to show your ID card and tell your Tamil to everyone to arm checkpoint military guards. My family has been murdered for various reasons. I still got to go to a Tamil curriculum school in Kalam, in Kandy. It's a majority single, I, you get to choose. You, your Tamil, I have a Tamil curriculum school. Our religion classes weren't religion. They were, what is your religion? You get to do it. So we had, it's so given. India has it. And it doesn't mean Hindutva doesn't show up. So I don't know why we care about Australia. I would care about racism in Australia. I'm not sure they have a great staging of that particular question. Whether multiculturalism at that very narrow level can feel very moot to me on those terms. So I'm only taking issue not with your position. I'm taking the issue that I'm not grounded. I am more, I'm very grounded on these terms. And to be at war with the social world is very different to be at romance with the social world. But to be at romance with the social world is not to bend to every going trope that it, it, it claims for itself. If they want to tell me white working class people are anti-immigration, anti-react, uh, and permanently socially conservative, that's on them. I don't believe white working class, I mean, I use the stupid language now, but you know, white working class are by default socially conservative. 
and somehow pathologically patriotic at every turn, because they too are the central armies for the multiculture I talk about. So that's a very different reckoning. Um, Islamophobia, yes, but I talked about that. We have, Islamophobia is about, in my opinion, the scrutiny of a particular background subject to pathological, stereotypical inferences. Because a, you can have a Sikh school, I have a student who went to a Sikh school, you can have Hindu schools, my family's in Harrow, there are Hindu faith schools, they're not subject to anywhere near the same scrutiny if you open a Muslim school. And how suddenly prevent shows up, and suddenly everything is audited about terrorist radicalization. I am interested in Islamophobia, I want their lives to be as good as everyone else's lives. But the point is, multiculturalism already makes the affordances. Something else is doing the nasty work. The racism shows up. The derogatory, suspect population frames shows up. And it's contingent. The same suspect populations were the Irish. Suspect population is a concept I take from a writer about I, I, uh, Irish life in England. Uh, Patrick, I forget his first name, Hillard. Hilliard. Sorry, do you remember? Yeah. So it's contingent. Sorry, okay, there we are. Thank you. Well, I guess now it's time to move away from the pugilistic <laughs> tension. Sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> so now it's time to open for Q&A. We are aiming to finish at 45. Obviously, if you need to leave, please do leave. Uh, can we collect questions? Uh, I would collect a few questions, comments that you have, please. David. So if I, if I didn't address a question to you, please, Valerie, uh, your, your, um, your hope for the future is entirely based, uh, or seems largely to be based amongst interactions amongst the working class, if, if I understood what you're saying correctly. Um, maybe you're more optimistic about things than, than I am, sure, sure. but it, 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 it strikes me that there is very, very little class conflict. Yeah, quite. And I and it go it going down. If you're um, if you're actually going to achieve the, the the social world with which you're in romance, it strikes me that you you are going. And I, I, I suspect you're coming from a far more left wing position than I am. But it's not going to work just building it on the working class. Question mark. Right. Can I see with that on the on the other question? Does it relate? Does it connect? Your question? Does it connect? Yeah, yours. It, it does, does it connect? It does really yeah, if it does, yes, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so yeah, building up on that, I, I, um, can you speak loudly if you can? Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, building on that, Holly, you were talking about um, this sort of symbolism of, of the working class, mm. and the, the white working class, and also avocados are fascinating. Why avocados are so important? <laughs> think the working class is, and I don't it's not come up too much in, in many of the panels I've been on, what, mm. what how nationalism actually imagines, you know, sort of a real citizen, a real working class mm. citizen, um, and, um, yeah, especially given the, 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 the actual, like, <coughs> working class doing the work are often highly multicultural, yeah. often not citizens, um, I, I think the example I'd give for this, because it's local to me, was the, um, the Just Eat Riders strike, uh, yeah. that's for me, which is in, just incredibly multi multi um, multilingual, multinational, multicultural, in so many ways, and very obviously just uh, <coughs> core sort of working parts of, of you know, Britain. So. Not really. Right. Any other questions? Who have a question for Tariq? But maybe we can go first to the answer. Is there another question? Balu, you go first. Yeah. Exactly. I'll answer that and then that. No, I couldn't agree more because I think you open up the right issue. Why does nationalism take such an interest? And why? Which is essentially a fetish, obviously. Uh, a fetish at their expense because it offers nothing but anything but materialist redress. But I think it's a fetish source. Firstly, that's why I thought it was very important to us. 
so much of English nationalism is locked into what he calls post-colonial melancholy. And by post-colonial melancholy, he doesn't mean 1920s. He means a kind of, upon independence, a 20-year, 30-year period where such the British motifs of British staging or English staging of Um, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. And therein, a very particular proletariat symbolism becomes rooted in, in a late industrial geography in a completely anachronistic way of a, a worker who looks a certain way and has a certain burly <laughs> orientation that could be a man of industry even if he never was. And the, the working, this particular image of the working class becomes the ur subject. And all sorts of the ur subject does distortion work. As you rightly say, any claim to the working class will have to reckon with the disproportionality of minority and certainly migrant labor, which is a very particular question about nationalism, never being able to address the class question because they cannot reckon with the migrant question. Uh, secondly, however, it is particularly distorted because their working class symbolism is actually talking about a pensioner class who is the principal voting bloc, a pensioner class who is property owning and usually gained from the late, the late support of the, the welfare state, the support of a late welfare state and an attached property boom. So it, it, it is no way an actual industrial labor or a downtrodden man of, of Middlesbrough deindustrialization per se because it assumes usually a particular age bracket, uh, a, a very particular voting block that they're very good at symbolizing. They cannot reckon at any level with a new reconfigured working classes of the tertiary economy, which is obviously gonna be much more metropolitan and have very different symbolic affectations. They're often going to be university educated, but who cares? You're university educated in a massified era. Over 50% of kids go to university. So you're going to be a, a university educated kid who can't get a job, who sits on precarity, and is locked out of the property market, and only relying on landlordist rent extraction. That is, in the old language, class conflict. In the old dated language, that is class conflict. But it cannot see it as such, because its symbolism is so fetishized. That is the work that Avocado does, unfortunately. Because, oh, you went to uni? Oh, you like a, you know, they used to talk about latte drinking liberals or something. I mean, it was so unhinged, this symbolic fetish. And it became outsized. And they, crucially, I couldn't agree more, they can't even deal with their own white working classes. Because they too are going to be constituted by grime music. They too are going to be constituted by the fan culture of the Premier League. I mean, I did, when I got in the taxi here, it, was a, not a, it wasn't a white English guy, admittedly, but he was blaring Stormzy. He was a 35-year-old Eastern European Uber driver. Do you know what you mean? Like, it's different. And this kind of fetishistic symbolism can't deal with an actual working class that is also being forged, but under con uh, recomposed class conflict or the encounter with class conflict. This kind of relates to your point. In, 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 of course, I'm not this crazy working class idealist. I'm only stressing that today because I think nationalism is doing a very particular work around the working class. Don't, if, if there is, of course, plenty middle class multiculture. Whether I'm really interested, I don't know, because I think it's softened by liberalism. <laughs> and it's softened by kind of lifestyle, cosmopolitan consumerism. But it's there, and if they want to vote a certain way, I'm here for them, like, cool, <laughs> you know? But that, is, that is, doesn't feel to me an overdetermined subject of contemporary nationalist politics. And I agree there is no class consciousness, but I do think in part there is no class consciousness because of the culturalization of class. So I'm interested, but we'll have to get through that morass. I'm not saying we'll get there, of course not. I have to pretend we would. What else? What's the point of writing otherwise? More woe me, dispiriting, dystopian affirmation. I don't know. It doesn't have. It doesn't rock my boat. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry. Right. Maybe uh, I can say something to that thing yeah, as well. You might use sorry. 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 I mean, just, just very briefly. Um, yeah. Just very briefly. So. I mean, multiculturalists 
Um, sorry. Um, multiculturalists have, have different takes on things, so I'm just going to speak for myself, but I think I speak as a multiculturalist, but you know, there will be others who have a different take. So, um, multiculturalists see um, society and the, um, the politics arising from um, group membership, whether it's uh, forms of class or uh, other groups, and obviously mainly multiculturalists are interested in non-economic identity groups or uh, membership groups, um, see these as um, a number of things um, at a particular time, and as Valma says, this can vary, so we obviously have to be thinking about um, time and place. There's no single formula for how multiculturalists should deal with class. But it's obvious that multiculturalists don't privilege class and the politics of class consciousness or uh, class-based um, politics, and certainly don't privilege one class over any other class, but would assume that a successful democratic polity um, would have to have um, cross-class political alliances and cooperation and movements, you know, exactly the kind of thing that the Labour Party uh, created for, for decades, though of course it, its um, coalitions also uh, break down and so on. And, but we also see actually the Conservative Party try to create uh, those coalitions because no political party can win power if all they're interested in is uh, defending or promoting the interests of, of one class. Um, and class can relate to issues around multiculturalism in a, in a number of different ways. And I am interested in uh, socioeconomic inequalities defined by you know, race and ethnicity and religious group membership and so on. Um, and the, these, these are important both as they relate to multicultural politics and as they relate to uh, other, other class issues. But I don't privilege uh, a class analysis as the way to understand um, the experiences of um, minority groups, non-white groups, non-Christian groups, and so on. And on your point, David, about, well, this very weak working class consciousness, so that has implications for certain kind of politics, yes. I very much agree with you about that. Um, so, weak working class consciousness or working, yeah, it, it can be a problem for the kind of social democratic politics that I would like to see uh, in place or return. Mm -hmm. um, so, it can be an issue. But I would say that multiculturalism neither um, needs nor promotes class identities. But of course, if they're there, it works with them. And sometimes a wider politics, not just multiculturalism, a wider social democratic politics of which multiculturalism may just be part, might flounder because of uh, weak class identities. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you a question, Tony, first, because I fully agree on your take about how each, every concept, not necessarily nation, etc., can never reach fullness. Um, so there is no single endpoint, and so there is no true nationalism. Um, this is a point also Eric Kaufman was is referring to to um, multivocality of nationalism. But I guess the criticism, I have two points. One is a criticism, the first maybe is more a um, question for clarification. The criticism is that, yes, everybody can have a different understanding of nation and nationalism, but not all are the same. So there is an e uneven power. Some have more traction, some have considered to be more legitimate. So there is an uneven power in this multivocality, obviously, that has to be taken into consideration, acknowledged. Um, so we are not all the same, and not all the versions are 
point. So this is one, one point. Second point, I think I was a bit confused. I'm not sure whether also some other people here in the audience were confused or not, because you said that nationalism is not about exclusion of others. Um, and first of all, we need to understand what we mean. You call it the normative character of nationalism. And the way you went about uh, is somehow different from what a student of nationalism would do. A student of nationalism would mention the state, the territory, the people. Uh, you, don't, you didn't mention the people, you just went for state, citizenship, belonging, and recognition. Uh, but the question is so, is there a one single true understanding of the normative character of nationalism? So, are you, in a sense, contradicting yourself when you go back and you say we need to understand the normative character of nationalism and you define it that way? So, that is the way it has to be defined? So, that would be the question, clarification. Can I see from the audience if there's any other points or questions? Possibly relating to this point? Yes. Uh, building on that, um, uh, Mr. Madhu, I was uh, thinking you could help me a little bit. In your, your paper, I felt like you moved from uh, an initial discussion of analysis, how do I analyze, and then you moved into a normative part where you said what should be. Um, but, and in that first part, it seemed like to me you were building on a kind of um, a post structuralist way of thinking of discourse analysis that hovers above the evidentiary. And um, so it, it, and it seems like you could ground that much more firmly in uh, some of the cognitive theorists who built on the initial work of uh, the philosopher you mentioned um, to really talk about how the mind works and how people do these things in their everyday lives. So I was just wondering if you could comment Any other question? Okay. Um, yes, thank you for your questions, uh, Marco, and thank you for yours. Um, maybe I'll just start with yours because um, I didn't get a chance to note it down and therefore mm. it's still, uh, I, I, while it's still in my mind. You're quite right. I mean, my whole um, idea of normative, of multicultural nationalism is normative. So that's, I hope, not in any way disguised or hidden or diluted because I'm totally upfront about that because I want to actually um, say that we need uh, a normative theory but as I also uh, mentioned, I take it to be a grounded theory so it's not just abstract normative theory like you know, Rawls's um, theory of justice or something like that. Um, This kind of uh, slippage, as you saw it, between an initial analytical set of steps and then um, a normative um, uh, follow-through. Um, I mean, that's not a bad characterization of the talk, but what's wrong with that? I, I couldn't see what the objection was. I started where I started because... A lot of people say to me, multicultural nationalism, oh Tariq, you're not really talking about nationalism. So I have to offer a conceptual account of what it is to talk about concepts such that I can justify why my multicultural nationalism is a form of nationalism. So that's why I needed the, the methodological preliminaries in order to then give a more fuller a normative account of multicultural nationalism. As for uh, looking at particular uh, cognitive theorists and so on, I mean, I, yeah, maybe, uh, that, do you mean people like, I don't know, Rogers Brubaker, or you, you mentioned people who build on the work of Wittgenstein? Yeah, uh, so Eleanor Raj, for example, who talks about how categories work. I see. aspects of a category that they didn't use in daily life. 
Okay, so I'm not that familiar with all that work, and certainly not uh, the one also that you mentioned. And I suppose a question I'd ask myself is, why would I need to go into that work to do what I'm doing? So maybe we could just take that up later. Um, and um, so you asked me two questions, uh, Marco. One is, um, you said, my saying that there is no single kind of nationalism reminds you of Eric Kaufman's talking about multivocality. And I don't mind that connection, you, you, you're making that connection, but it's not actually what I was saying, because I was saying there can be different kinds of nationalisms. Eric Kaufman, in talking about multivocality, says that members of the same country, of the same nation, can have different conceptions of what their national identity is. And I think, actually, he's right about that. So I share that view, but that's not what I was arguing for. In fact, that's the kind of thing we argued for um, in the report that you mentioned right at the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, The Future of Multi-Ethnic Britain, where we said that in a country like Britain, there are a number of competing narratives about what it is to be British. And an important part of multicultural politics is exactly the challenging of some narratives and the promotion of others, but not necessarily always in a kind of prefixed, top-down ways, but through uh, more uh, dialog dialogical and um, bottoms-up politics. So I'm, I'm very happy to have what we might call a, a perspective on um, how people see their national identity in a family resemblance way. You know, some overlapping and some not overlapping. Uh, and I think, you know, in a way, in Britain, we have that because even more than most countries, we have very um, ambiguous and confused ideas about our national identity, and they're very much shaped by whether you're in south, south of England or some other part of England or Scotland or Wales and so on, and then, you know, class comes into it as well, not to mention ethnicity and all these things. So I'm not against multivocality. I think multivocality captures something that's norm uh, uh, analytically or descriptively true and has a normative potential. So I'm ha happy with that. But I suppose the real question that you're posing to me is, but what about if the different conceptions, perspectives held by different citizens are caught within unevenly distributed power structures? So yeah, we could, we could have 10 different perspectives, but if only two of them are powerful enough to command a consensus or to um, you know, be powerful, to be dominant in the media or whatever. Yeah, so of course, multiculturalists are always trying to make sure that minority voices um, are included from a position of marginality or, or total absence. Um, by trying to create platforms, by trying to encourage dialogical politics, um, and as I say, by a, a bottoms-up um, mobilization. So there is always an issue of power. There isn't, a, I don't particularly have a, a solution to that. I just see that as well, that's just how the world is. There will always be uh, both ideational contestations and um, power contestations, and the two usually are, are, are intertwined. Um, then your second point was that you thought I was betraying my starting point because I said, look, there are a number of different kinds of nationalisms. There's no one true, uh, true nationalism. But then I recommended or commended, advocated for uh, no, uh, multicultural nationalism. But yes, but, I, but remember I was saying I'm recommending it, advocating it as a feasible alternative to monocultural nationalism. So I'm already identifying two forms of nationalism um, and saying that they're present in the world. One at the moment is more dominant than the other, but the second needs to be argued for 
explained and argued for, organized for, promoted, and when it, um, that happens, it has a real political chance of winning. And why I believe that is because when we look at uh, opinion polls, certainly in Britain, perhaps other countries may be similar or different, we find that roughly speaking, about a third of the electorate say they're very pro-diversity. They're very comfortable with diversity. Some of these people are white, some of them are not white, but roughly about a third of the population. And a, th a third of the population say they're very unhappy with how things are. They think that we have too much diversity, that too much change is happening too quickly, that people like themselves are being marginalized, not heard, and so on. And they're predominantly, but not only, but predominantly white. And then there's a third in the middle that are both inclined towards some aspects of diversity and some aspects of our national identity needs to be more affirmed. It's at the moment too much under attack and people aren't speaking up enough for it and so on. And sometimes they want both. Sometimes they're just contradicting themselves and so on. That's, that's normal life. That's how our electorate is. So what I'm saying is that multicultural nationalism of the kind I've put to you has a chance, a real chance, a real world chance, not just an abstract ideal hope, a real world chance of building a winning electoral consensus by bringing the pro-diversity and the, the third in the middle who are not so sure into a uh, winning coalition. So that's what I mean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valu. I think we need to draw to a close here, given the time, and everybody might uh, go away. So please join me in congratulating the two speakers. Thank you very much. Now, we have the president of the ASIN to announce what's going to happen next. So if you can please uh, bear with us, if you can. Hi, folks. Um